This is a podcast from The Bugle. But Mr Addisbury, I'm fully aware that you only married me to save me from the scandal. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude and I see my duty plain. Her eyes were cast modestly down towards the hands in her lap and she didn't see the sudden convulsive movement the vicar made by the mantelpiece staring into the fire. I will do my best to be a most conformable wife and never give you cause to regret your sacrifice. Sacrifice! Margaret! Oh, Margaret! Two swift steps from the fire and he was on his knees before her. Margaret, forgive me. I never married you to spare your, you scandal. I was glad, glad, I tell you, to have the chance to offer anything to one so far above me. I was selfish only, though I cloaked it in, in fine words. I wanted you, only you. Her eyes flew up wide to meet his. Suddenly they were breast to breast, all doubts cast aside. Oh, Mr. Addisbury, call me Pericles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pericles. <laughs> Oh, Pericles, how foolish I have been. My love, only as foolish as The Gargle. This is The Gargle, a sonic, glossy magazine to the Bugle's audio newspaper for visual world. All of the news, none of the politics. I'm your host, Alice Fraser, and your guest editors for this week's edition of the magazine are Alison Spittle. Hello. Boo, boo, boo. And boo, 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 and John Luke Roberts. Hi. <laughs> 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 is that what we're, that's what we're doing now, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're impersonating okay. chickens. Okay. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, but before we beatbox down and get into the rhythmic, uh, r- rhythmic rap battle that is this week's top story, let's have a look at the front cover. The front cover of this week's magazine is Harry Styles posing provocatively with his own controversial hairline. Uh, which has been making news in the last few weeks, Harry Styles' hairline. I, I don't understand why it's such a scandal that he may or may not be balding. To me, I, I, I don't really understand balding as an unattractive thing. To me, I think I like to think of it as a, a slow motion skull sc- strip tease. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, a beautiful that's a nice way. way. Of it. Yeah. yeah, they they put they put balding people in bars, and uh, you know, people get entertained. Just get a nipple tattooed in the very centre of your skull and wait for it to slowly be revealed and then start wow. saying, my eyes are down here. <laughs> but what if you end up just ravaged by babies? Just, they see it and they're, they're latching on like nobody's business. You're trying to sing uh, watermelon, um, whatever it is, and there's a baby on your head ruining your concert. Uh, ravaged by babies, ironically enough, the title of Harry Styles' next album. The satirical cartoon this week is the stressful American politics of recently past Thanksgiving being given a fast and the furious nos boost by the introduction of weight loss drug Ozempic. Uh, a huge amount of, of hand wringing in America about the impact of Ozempic on Thanksgiving dinners, just in case wow. you're worried That's hilarious. about how stressful it is. What's Ozempic? Oh, is that a weight? That's the thing you put in there and it makes your appetite go down. Yeah, yeah. It's the uh-huh. diabetes drug that people are using off-label to lose weight in, in huge right. chunks. I assume it doesn't come off in chunks. I presume <laughs> it does. <laughs> they carve you like a turkey, you know? It's just gone every week. Let's jump into our top story this week. Top story is uh, 2016 hipster paradise news, I guess, <laughs> which is the news that uh, Australian scientists in pursuit of the... Movember fundraising for men's mental health initiative have managed to put a teeny tiny moustache on a red blood cell. Um, the tiniest moustache <laughs> measuring uh, just five microns. Uh, they've managed to paste it onto a blood cell, presumably f- for a purpose, to create a moustache so tiny it cannot be seen with the naked eye, which, to be fair, any 13-year-old boy can do with enough effort. <laughs> uh, Alison Spittle, um, you've judged a moustache in the past can you unpack this one for us yeah i love it this is done by like a some australian scientists and it's it's to it's to um it's to advertise that movember is happening it's to gain awareness for movember as if people aren't aware that movember is happening when you know there's about six different colleagues that are saying don't worry i'm not wearing i'm not i'm not growing this moustache for fun i'm growing this for cancer (laughs) and it feels like it feels like um, it feels like we, we give we give people the chance to be whimsical, but we give them the excuse to be whimsical with their with their 
with their body hair and that makes me sad because I think you should just grow a moustache because you want to grow a moustache and I, I love I love the pictures that come with this uh, story it looks like this red blood cell is in witness protection you know <laughs> and uh, it's, t- it's wearing a disguise for its own good maybe like what Red blood cells, do they have like natural enemies within? Are they rivals with white blood cells or do they get along quite well? There's like white blood cells, red blood cells and plasma. And I don't want to make it like sectarian in your veins, but I wonder like how, how did their, how is their relationship, do you know? You mean sort of West Side Story? Yes. I would love to see a musical of, I would love to see any red blood cell try and click and go, hey, daddy O, you know, that would be wonderful. But, I think yeah. they're probably more friendly colleagues um, than than nemesis. Than en- nemesis. Okay, I think, I, think if, if, I think if they're nemesis, you're in trouble. Basically. Oh God, yeah, that's a disease. That's that's yeah. a form of disease that no one's going to come out well out of that. I don't know. I'd like to see an autoimmune version of West Side Story. I think it could be. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, it's cancer. <laughs> I thought I told you to get out of here ten years ago. Well, I'm back, baby. You know. That's very sad, actually. So. Yeah, it's very sad. I, don't know. Yeah. I agree with Alison on the November thing. I think it's, and as, a, as somebody who often has a moustache, um, I feel like November is the coward's excuse for it. Just, just grow the thing. Don't take this pretense of charity to do what you want to do anything. It's a bit like a smaller mm. version of when people go off to walk the Great Wall of China but raise lots of money for a charity while they're doing it. No, you just wanted to do, do something unpleasant for sponsorship. Don't do something that you wanted to do anyway, but you're looking for an excuse. And that's my angry. My other point is, why are scientists doing this? There's lots of other science which would be much more helpful um, than to raise awareness by making something that cannot even be seen. But that, that feels like 75% of all gargle stories is sure. why are scientists doing this when... Yeah, but there's know. not going to be... Imagine if... I don't think... There's always the chance of like an accidental breakthrough that they go, oh, wow, this applies to the... We're not going to get... like. There's no, there's no world in which trying to put a tiny moustache on a, on a red blood cell through a series of improbable occurrences ends up with climate change being fixed. <laughs> it's, it sounds like a decent screenplay. It, it does sound like the beginning of a, of a up, upbeat, updated Jekyll and Hyde story <laughs> where someone gets injected with the tiny moustache and it starts manifesting. Uh, I, look, I, I feel like growing a moustache for men's mental health awareness is a, a really lovely and laudable thing for people to do this month, though I would mm-hmm. say... Uh, if you grow startling enough facial hair at any time of year, it will raise awareness of men's mental health. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, yeah. I'm just looking at this blood cell again. The moustache is not that; it's exactly the moustache of Julius Pringles, the um, <laughs> the Pringles logo man. <laughs> this is an origin story for Julius Pringles. This is the scientists <laughs> go in, they put a moustache and red blood cell, and then a a crisp pushing or a crisp like object pushing um, circle goes wild yeah well that's what they say about arterial blood once you pop you can't stop (laughs) (laughs) your ad section now because you can't be what you can't buy and this episode of the podcast is brought to you by not believing in ghosts if you're watching a spooky movie alone at night in a dark house and your light bulb flickers try not believing in ghosts. If you feel the touch of phantom fingers on your ankles as you take a totally sensible late night shortcut through a deconsecrated graveyard, try not believing in ghosts. If you see mysterious messages traced in mist on your bedroom mirror that you brought at a haunted op shop while the face of your long dead great grandmother mouths the words to her favourite song and the radio slowly plays an off key version of 30s jazz, try really, really, really hard not believing in ghosts. Not believing in ghosts. The only proven tactic to keep ghosts away. <laughs> if you're unwell or tired or pregnant, try sustaining yourself with small nutrient-dense meals such as soups and sustaining broths. If the broth is too salty, try adding half a glass of water. Hey. Half a glass of water. Sometimes half a glass less salty is half a glass more soup. <laughs> a small town. Ah, it's the sort of place no one ever gets murdered. A horrible murder. It was the most horrible murder I've ever seen, and I'm a professional murderer looker. A modern whodunit. We have no idea whodunit. A journalist who's in too deep. 
nobody here knows that I'm actually the murderer. The new true crime podcast from Cash Grab Network. True crime, active crime scene. In other advertising news, this is the news that Meta, ex-Facebook, but not X, uh, apparently has been accused of designing its platform to get children and teens addicted to it. Uh, ironically enough, given that Facebook is now populated mainly by the over 50s crowd. But uh, John Luke Roberts, uh, you've had an argument with an angry uncle on Facebook before. Can you unpack this story for us? Um, uh, yes. So, well, that, I mean, you just did, didn't you? They've, <laughs> their court documents allege that Meta has not been sufficiently throwing children off its platform who aren't allowed to be on its platform, and even worse, have been designing the whole thing to make children addicted to it anyway. Now, we know that they've been designing it to make adults addicted to it. I know that because I, I looked at my phone 30 times in the last five minutes we've been recording. <laughs> Just scrolling down and down and down for no good reason and a tiny little boost of oh, somebody like that thing I did. So that's, um, well, this is a story. Meta say they're not doing that, but that's what Meta would say anyway. Um, and my uncle actually isn't on Facebook um, because uh, he he he's not he, he's not that kind of he's not that kind of uncle. He's a nice staid uncle who stays at home and reads books. And the internet, I think, is still a mystery to him. The best kind of uncle, as we're all rapidly discovering. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Now my brother. Don't get me started on him. Uh, he he called Tony Blair a Trotskyite the other day, which was uh, just blew my mind. Wow. Anyway, I know. <laughs> Where do you go from there? How do you carry on? He thinks that capitalism Ring would the be the... Ring the politics bell, He thinks that... Uh, he thinks capitalism is the solution to things, or would be if anyone had ever tried it. Wow. Yeah. We should really give it a go. Yeah, maybe. You know? Maybe that's what we should do. Um, maybe that's what we should do. My favourite bit about the story is that it's an open secret... Uh, they refer to this as an open secret of underage people and I read that headline and this is the <laughs> best story that's ever come after that headline like I was so afraid of what was going to happen next but uh, yeah it's it's just basically gone that meta are a bit sneaky and I'm very happy that I didn't have Facebook as a teenager but I did have a bit of social media I had Bebo and I had uh, MySpace now Bebo kind of definitely destroyed my brain in regards to, you had to pick 16 top friends. And I would look through all the kids in my school. And if I wasn't in their top friends, I would make a massive effort to befriend them, then get in their top <laughs> friends and then drop them like a hot shit and move on to the next person. <laughs> I was an absolute friend slut back in the day. I just wanted to be liked. And uh, comedy is really helpful with that personality trait of mine. <laughs> <laughs> really, really cured myself from that. Um, but yeah, it 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 basically. Why are we? Why are we always? I don't think we're surprised, but it's it's funny that Meta are still, in somewhat given they're denying it, and it's like we know anecdotally, and now we know, like from actual evidence of you, that you are you are doing stuff that that wrecks children's brains. I mean, most apps nowadays are designed to essentially be pokey machines to just hit that dopamine reward system. Even the scrolling thing is meant to give you a kind of a feeling that you're you're gambling. Mm. And I think the the most uh, sort of telling thing is that almost every tech executive doesn't let their children use it. <laughs> so, yes, that's a big thing. I wonder do people who invented vapes and the vape industry let children. It feels like we are allowing our children to be damaged for our capitalism, whether it be vaping or uh, with social media. We know it's bad, but the kids are addicted to it and want it, and we give it to them rather than like have a... Well, I don't know. I don't have kids, so I can't be talking like this. Well, Meta made a statement uh, about this, saying it favours shifting the burden of policing underage usage to app stores and parents, and uh, that, that things like Google and Apple would have to obtain parental approval whenever youths under 16 download apps which sounds like a five minute challenge for youths under 16 who have been Definitely. faking their parents signature on 
uh, report cards for the last five years. Oh, I, I had a full on period for two years uh, when I didn't need to, when I, you know, when I was getting off PE, my my mum was signing a little slip to say that I was menstruating at the time. Uh, probably the Guinness Book of Records for the longest ever menstruation because it was just for a full two years. So I feel like, uh, yeah, I feel like allowing kids to to get around their parents is just a cool challenge. Gosh, Alison, Alison, the number of tiny moustaches which could have found a home in those two years. I know, they're just dead. They're just... <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like a barber's floor, so it is, just full of moustaches. Yeah, I know someone whose parents involuntarily taught him lock picking by putting increasingly elaborate locks on the basement where they kept the stuff that he wanted to get at. So. Oh, wow. Oh, I remember one time, like, no one drank gin in my house and then my aunt came round and uh, she poured out a bit of gin. She's like, that is water. And uh, that was because I kept stealing the gin as a teenager and <laughs> filling it up with water. And uh, I just pretended I, didn't, I, I pretended I was a reverse Jesus. I was like, <laughs> you know. And that brings us to our reviews. As you know, each week we ask our guest editors to bring in something to review out of five stars. Alison Spittle, what have you brought in for us this week? So I am reviewing uh, this. This is a coaster that has uh, two naked people on it. Um, I don't know where it's come from. It's just in my house. I don't know where it is. So I'm reviewing it. Uh, it's a very good. It's a very good coaster. It kind of listen to this. Solid. Uh, keeps the heat off a uh, table. But to to talk through uh, the the picture itself, the male has socks on, and the the woman character doesn't have socks on. Uh, it makes me feel a bit happy. Arousal, not much, to be honest with you, but I don't know what the aim of this coaster is. So I'm going to give it... Uh, like, could you na- What do you think their names would be if you were to name these two people, Alice? Well, first of all, to be specific, they're two naked people facing yes. the viewer and they, are, they appear to be either protecting each other's modesty or fingering each other. <laughs> <laughs> Why not both? Why not both? <laughs> and I just... Um, I'm going to go Paul and Becky Ann. That's what I think they're called. And um, yeah, they're covering, they're covering each other up. It's very cute. Um, I, I, I presume it belongs to my flatmate. Um, I hope it does because he's the only person I live with. And uh, if he doesn't own them, I don't know how they got into the house. But I'll, I'll find out for <laughs> next time I'm on. How many stars? Four for cuteness out of five. John Luke, what have you brought in for us this week? In preparation for this session, last night I was um, looking through my notebooks, thinking, well, what can I review? What do I have opinions on? And I've decided instead to review my notebook keeping practices because my notebooks, <laughs> my notebooks are where I keep my jokes. They have ideas about things like I've got an idea how about um, like, uh, not being able to meet a very tall person without telling them they're tall. That's a reasonable idea. You could stretch that out to a, you know, and, but, but I'm not going to do that. The problem is, as I've been looking through this, oh, well, I don't want to do the tall thing tomorrow. I don't want to do the thing about portal loose because I've done that before. Oh, what about the word crisps that has piss in it? But we just go on as if it's normal. But they, um, we, uh, <laughs> the problem is, as I'm looking through this, going, what's what fits a review thing? I keep my journal in the same book as my notes. And so I've been going through this and being hit regularly as I'm stumbling over my comic things by the various emotionally unpleasant things which have happened to me over the last couple of years. So there's basically, I look at, I look, I'm, I'm looking, oh, is that funny? Is that funny? It's very hard to tell if something's funny when you're immediately hit by the grief of a divorce just one page <laughs> afterwards. So I would like to, basically, this is a self-reflexive review and I would like to review my notebook keeping and I give it I give it one star. I need to separate these things out, put them in different places so that in the future I can be the hilarious um, ball of bonhomie that I'm meant to be. It was one star, wasn't it? One star, yeah, one star. Well, I don't know. Artistically, I think six stars maybe. I think there's a certain there's a there's a there's a beauty in there from the way that those things are put in contrast with each other and the things it can throw up. But I don't like it on a personal level. 
<laughs> Artistically, it's shades of light and darkness <laughs> interspersed seemingly at random, but actually if you examine them, there's a deep underlying thread of commonality. Just like life itself. <laughs> My notebooks hold a mirror up to life, as all <laughs> art should. Oh, you've really brought me round. I think they're great. <laughs> And in underage smell news now, <laughs> the introduced this story. Uh, uh, fashion house Dior has released a, a bottle of scented water for babies that is uh, going to cost $230, uh, which is significantly more expensive than Dior's best-selling fragrances for adults. Um, you know... I love the smell of a baby. Alison Spittle, you also enjoy the smell of a baby. Can you unpack this story for us? Oh, I was like, I think this is one of the stories that filled me most with rage because we must have had this conversation several times before. I'm probably not going to have kids, right? Uh, but there's nothing I love more than the smell of a baby's head. Like, genuinely, it, a smell of a baby's head for me is like wet earth in the sun, you know, like uh, just one of those great <laughs> smells that you can never recreate. Also, uh, the pliability of a baby's head. It's like wet earth. <laughs> 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 I just love kissing wet earth. Just, mm, <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those smells that is the most incredible smells in the world, and I just can't believe that Dior would make a better smell than the top of a baby's head. They've described the bouquet, and I think it's got like. There was like smells of pear in this uh, in this new baby water smell. I don't want my baby to smell like a pear, you know. I want my baby to smell like old milk and human skin, because that's what isn't that the combo? Would you describe what would you describe the bouquet of a baby's head to be like? There's nothing that it smells like other than itself. I feel like you could sell the smell of a baby to someone else, but trying to make your baby smell not like a baby is a bad move because there's nothing that smells better than a baby in its own particularly... Because it has that thing, that kind of controversial edge to it, like like uh, a truffle or something, where it is in objectively sort of disgusting, but nonetheless impossible to turn away from. Uh yeah, I always used to resent when when I would introduce people to my baby and they'd be wearing a strong perfume and they'd cuddle my baby and give me back my baby smelling of their horrible perfume instead of its its babiness. I think you're right. I think a baby's head smells slightly like cheese. Do you know what I mean? Imagine getting a perfume that smelled like a baby. I would wear it, but I'd be weirded out by the people that were attracted to me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, because I think people wear perfume. There's two reasons. And it's like either sex, because they want, not that everything's for sex, but they, they want to smell attractive, right? And the other reason people smell per, or, or wear perfume is to cover up Throw other off smells. the scent of the blood towns. What? Yes, that's <laughs> Big time. But like, to, you don't need to do that to a baby. And it's baby water, isn't it? So I presume you're bathing the baby in this kind of perfume stuff. That's the vibe it's given. It's or is it just you spritz in your baby? I think it's water yeah, just because there's no baby. alcohol in it because they don't want to put alcohol in a baby perfume. Um. That's fair. Because <laughs> they took alcohol out of like a colic medicine. Now, my mum had a... I don't know why, because I'm the oldest child, but I had a big... I had a. I, I used to babysit from a very young age with very young babies. Oh, I thought and you were going to say you reverse babysat, and like as a two-year-old, you were looking after your ten-year-old uh, siblings. Imagine that, yeah. But like, I changed my sister's first nappy, and if you have you ever changed a first nappy, is like, it's crazy because you expect like a little baby shit. I don't know, like a little poo emoji, but it comes out like mint sauce, and I was just so crazy. You know, that was crazy to me that it would be so green and then I'm like well because... oh, you meant the colour I was just checking you meant the colour not the smell the first, <laughs> yes. the first... So, so as a sidebar for people who are interested uh, what happens is uh, when a baby in, uh, babies don't have any fat they start with fur they have like little hairs all over their bodies and then as they grow fat in the womb they shed all of their hair and then they practice like breathing and eating by <laughs> eating all the hair and so their first poo is made up of this like hor horrific slurry <laughs> um, <laughs> And after that, baby poo becomes uh, remarkably inoffensive until they start solid food because it is essentially just 
real place. cheese that was yeah, in it's cheese. It's half human an hour cheese. ago. <laughs> That's what they would name Baby Bells Baby Bells. You know? They're harvesting I don't think it comes I think out of wax yeah. wrapped pellets. If I was the ad department for Baby Bell 2, I wouldn't lean into that angle. <laughs> The thing is, what you've described, mm. um, if the smell of the baby is naturally like attractive, and it and obviously that makes sense that there's evolutionary ways to have like to protect your baby. If actually this may be a safety measure to disguise the smell so nobody takes your baby to smell it. So you get to keep your baby <laughs> because they think, oh no, that's just a pair. There's no need in taking those. I can get one of those at the supermarket. So I actually it's just think an expensive handbag. Yeah, is what, that Dior? <laughs> so what, what Dior are doing is um, a public good, and actually two thousand to two hundred and thirty dollars to keep your baby. I think that's a great deal. <laughs> it's like a ransom, isn't it? Yeah, it prevents you. Apparently, though, the they are they are upset over this, like uh, scientists, because it could prevent you from bonding with your own baby. Because the whole you're so right, John, about like how the human humans have been made that you know they make the smell of a baby good because babies cry a lot and like you go oh f off baby but then you smell it and you're like oh all is forgiven you know uh, and i and i hate the idea of you not being able to bond with your baby because it smells like dior i have that problem just with people who smell like jupe or davidoff cool water <laughs> uh, sorry to any listeners who wear that uh but I, I get triggered by the smell of jupe and not like not any terrible memories with it but I can smell it on the tube sometimes and I'm like is this a 16 year old boy from Ireland like who is on this tube that's, that's wearing jupe it just it just feels wrong would the reverse mechanism work so that if a baby instead of screaming the baby is very very smelly but it's mercifully silent like would that also be a way of um, you know would Bonding. that be a way for a baby to survive? Would that be a Maybe, way? Or if the baby started doing jokes or something, or little compliments, you know, like a three, you you pick up the three month old baby and it's like, you're capable of love. You, you know? see, yeah, the, the the affirmations from a baby. I think a baby doing jokes would just get right up my nose. The precocious precociousness of that. Preco <laughs> preco is it precociousness? Gosh, I'm yeah. thirty. I bet I bet a precocious baby could could say the right word for. Precush, precush, precush. I wonder what precush. types of baby, what types of jokes a baby would do. I'm trying to think of like a baby style joke. It's like uh, peekaboo. Where is that guy? I mean, uh, my daughter's first joke was, uh, "Is it a hat?" It's not a hat. Which, <laughs> I mean, obviously, she didn't have the words for that because this was pre pre words, but it was a pretty funny joke. No, oh, that's cool. It's not a hat. It, uh, I've, I, you know, I, I've, I, I've spent quite a lot of money training at clown school, and um, many people have never gone up to that level. I think. <laughs> well, uh, sorry to clarify for the listener who is uh, watching this on YouTube. Um, for the premise of the joke to work, the thing that she's using as a hat can't be a hat. Just want to make it clear. Oh well, no. Until you get meta, I think a little bit down the line, you could start to introduce hats. <laughs> <laughs> and then the and then the joke would be that no, it is a hat, but I'm saying it's not a uh, hat. Mm. Or a drawing of a hat. A hat. A dra a very, drawing of a hat would be pretty good. Oh very French. Ceci n'est pas un chapeau. <laughs> I would literally watch that in a fringe show, though. You were describing something. I literally have. <laughs> <laughs> And in friendship news now, the news that China is in a friendship recession. And there are various people trying to remedy slash benefit from that problem. Uh, Jean-Luc, you understand recessions. Can you unpack this story for us? Well, I see you say I understand recessions rather than understand friendship. So that's, that, that's <laughs> telling. Um, well, yeah, I, 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 the thing which is really struck, I mean, I think this is a study done by um, a like a, a social media app called Soul, which they've done to try and um, say that they are the, the they can help. Um, which seems to me, as we've sort of proven the opposite of what social media does, um, but that they can deal with the friendship recession by helping you make imaginary friends. Imaginary friends has never been the problem, right? In fact, that, that is part of the friendship recession. Although actually, 
if we should deal with friendship in purely economic terms as like talking about them as recessions maybe this is the right way because because money's kind of imaginary too so we can just go completely down to if we treat this is it if we treat friendship like capitalism we've got it solved you don't need <laughs> the chicken itself you just need the coin that represents the chicken you don't need the friend you just need the little picture of a friend and then you can sort this out maybe we'll have friendship inflation where everyone has really really big friends i mean this, i mean this <laughs> The picture of the friend is a relevant thing because one of the ways in which this app soul is trying to pursue genuineness is by having its members interact under avatars rather than their real pictures on the premise that the more fakely you represent yourself, the more truly you'll actually inhabit yourself. Well, I think actually this uh, is the, it's the philosophy of Batman forever when there's an awful lot of time given over to the idea of wearing a mask revealing your true self. So um, mm. Soul have just picked up on that. It's such a weird yeah. thing, this avatar, um, because they're described, when you talk about the relationship between capitalism and friendship, because they have like almost like sponsored avatar packages from companies. And they say, this is to forge a deeper connection, for brands to forge a deeper connection with people, which is a weird thing to want. Like, I don't want my brand to forge a deeper connection with me. And they have like companies like Chevrolet who then sponsor avatar packs where you can pick like hair inspired by Chevrolet or glasses or accessories. And then there's all these other different companies. And I was thinking of like, what company would I like to represent me as an avatar and to forge a deeper connection with? And I think that would be, uh, I think that would be the, the, the chocolate brand Eminem. Um, uh, and the M&M &M store to sponsor some avatar packs for me because um, I quite like the green M&M &M. I think she's a sexy lady and uh, if I was to misrepresent myself I mean I must have done this when I was a teenager I used to misrepresent myself all the time on the internet I used to go in chat rooms and I used to always be yeah. ASL <laughs> 16 female California and I'd be like 12 living in the middle of Ireland but I felt like that was I the think that's closer to honest than I was I was like 63 living in Minnesota I was always like a f <laughs> discontented housewife but I love I that I love that because you, were you so you were 63 so did you have to like li did, did people ask you questions about your life and you had to like answer it as what you thought a 63 yeah i just old. give sort of benevolent advice to people who are trying to have cyber sex with each other <laughs> you see <laughs> you'd be like i hope you use protection some some yeah. cyber protection from that don't jump like, into anything too quickly <laughs> oh my god that's wonderful i used to go in this vampire chat room a lot as a teenager <laughs> and people used to really build up incredible worlds when i look at it you know like instead the intro would be like a vampire uh walks into the tavern and puts down his coat and looks around this is incredible three paragraph intro and then i would come in as like clown car on fire 69 <laughs> and i would pretend to be a, a, a i would pretend to be a vehicle that's on fire in the bar <laughs> and i'd be like the flames the flames <laughs> And they would always try and kill me. They would help because I'd be annoying. And I'd be like, I got a force field. You can't throw me out until the moderators would throw me out. But I had a great time. That's what I used to do. It was a definite kind of cry for help from me. Like, well, to be fair, a, a flaming vehicle has just as much uh, right to be in a tavern as a vampire. I mean, what, what, <laughs> what's that vampire drinking in there? Beer? It's ridiculous. Go to a blood bank. That's where the vampire should be. You did you did that world a service by making it at least slightly realistic. <laughs> yeah, just the, to, and also I have to wait to be invited in like a vampire. You know, you're like come in, flaming vehicle. <laughs> well, but uh, yeah, that was a uh, that was the thing I used to do. It was good fun. I love this story because it just it kind of reminded me of the. It's almost like aspects of the internet in the late 90s early 2000s that i really enjoyed you know this whole avatar thing that that this feels like a very early 2000s idea to represent yourself virtually one yeah second life one of the one of the most mm. menacing things about this article is uh souls uh the, the app souls attempt at, at monetization mentioning 
among other things, that Gen Z consumers crave active involvement rather than passive consumption, which feels to me like the first of uh, three steps that end with people having to do their own advertising to themselves, like the way oh you now have God. to beep your own stuff going through the checkout. <laughs> you oh, like, my God. Have to, like, why would I like this brand what's good about coca-cola and then you have to do the work and make yourself want it but it's it's like some advertisements especially on the tube now is very much like it'll go like uh, you're working 12 hours a day why not get a takeaway and it just it just feels like it's you're basically on life is shit why not get a takeaway to keep yourself from going over the edge <laughs> Just try and feel if any single one of your red blood cells has a tiny moustache on it. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like this is the real, like this is the real last straw for all of those girls in like 2016 who got a tiny moustache tattooed on the inside of their index finger. My yeah. friend has a tiny moustache and then another finger that says YOLO. So she, when she goes like this, it has a moustache here and then YOLO here. So it kind of helps when she poses like that. She she has a house now. She has a mortgage <laughs> and a house. And fair play to her. Yeah. Fiona Frawley, I'll give you a call out there. Great comedian and great tattoos. And that brings us to the end of the episode. I'm flipping through the ads at the back. Uh, John Luke Roberts, have you got anything to plug? Um, well, if you're in London, I am hosting uh, my hopefully annual Christmas gig as Geoffrey Chaucer, the medieval poot, on the 17th of December at 21 Soho um, and who's on that Rosie Jones Huge Davies uh, Frankie Thompson Ella the Great and Christian Brighty and maybe a secret Christmas um, visitor ho 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 his father will have Father Christmas there Father Christmas going to be gone. also uh, my podcast Soundheap is coming back in the new year um, and oh, we'll hooray. announce that uh, shortly that's a, the podcast of too many podcasts um, I'm very happy about that and uh, looking for that will be launching in February uh, if you're in London I highly recommend going to this uh, Christmas show if you have not seen uh, Chaucer doing his thing you will have missed a, an enormous amount of penis um, wait well, it's not real penis. it's not I just need to say it's not a real penis it's made of modeling balloons and um, I'm sort of offended that people think it's a real penis <laughs> <laughs> Uninflated modelling balloons. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> Alison, have you got anything to plug? Yes. Uh, so my play Glacier starts in the old fire station in Oxford uh, next Monday. So if you come on the Monday, the Wednesday or the Friday, uh, say hello because I'm going to be there because I'm a freak who likes to watch my own plays. And um, then uh, I got a tour that's coming up called Soup. That's on in the new year. If you go to my Instagram or my website, alisonspill.com, you'll find all information. And also, Soho Theatre have just announced I'm doing a run in March. So please come along to that. And uh, I'm also, this is out on the Friday. Go watch me on House of Games and see how it all ends. And I'll talk about it when I'm back on the podcast. <laughs> and I can be free oh, to talk about it. I can't it. wait. Um... You can find me online at patreon.com slash Alice Fraser One Stop Shop for all of my stand-up specials, podcasts, blogs, my weekly salons and my now twice weekly writers meetings. If, you are, if you're working on something, if you have any creative urges, uh, we, we come along, we write together, then we do a bit of a workshop. If you feel like uh, sharing or if you feel like hiding, it's all, we're all very welcome at the moment. You get access to all of that uh, for a dollar a month. Um, please get on board that before I start to get more organized and charge more money. Um, also, my show Twists and Kronos, my two solo shows of the last two years, will be out before Christmas with Go Faster Stripe and also available on my Patreon there. So um, that's quite an exciting thing if you like my stand-up comedy. This is a Bugle podcast and Alice Fraser production. Your editor is Ped Hunter. Your executive producer is Chris Skinner. I'll talk to you again next week. You can listen to other programs from The Bugle, including The Bugle, Catharsis, Tiny Revolutions, Top Stories and The Gargle, wherever you find your podcasts. 